Cartagena Manifesto, 15th of December, 1812. After the collapse of the First Venezuelan Republic in mid-1812, and the capture by royalists of the patriot leader Francisco de Miranda, Bolivar sought exile in the port of Cartagena de Indias, in nearby New Granada. In this manifesto, he sought to explain the reasons for the failure of independence in Caracas, blaming the principle of tolerance which had left Venezuela unguarded and unable to respond effectively to Spain's first attempts at reconquest. In writing this memorial, I want to spare New Granada from Venezuela's fate and to release Venezuela from its present suffering. Please accept my words with indulgence, fellow citizens, and believe me that my intentions are laudable. I am, Granadans, a son of unhappy Caracas, who escaped by a miracle from amidst her physical and political ruins. I have come here ever faithful to the liberal and just system proclaimed by my country, to follow the banners of independence which wave so gloriously here. Please allow me, inspired by patriotic zeal, to sketch briefly the reasons for Venezuela's destruction. I flatter myself that the terrible and exemplary lessons which that extinct republic has supplied may induce America to mend her ways and correct her obvious shortcomings in governance, those of unity, strength, and energy. The most grievous error committed by Venezuela in making her start on the political stage was, as none can deny, her fatal adoption of the system of tolerance a system long condemned as weak and inadequate by every man of common sense, yet tenaciously maintained with an unparalleled blindness to the very end. The first indication of senseless weakness demonstrated by our government was manifested in the case of the city of Coro, which, having refused to recognize the legitimacy of the government, was declared in rebellion and treated as an enemy. The supreme junta, instead of subjugating that undefended city, which would have surrendered as soon as our maritime forces had appeared off its harbour, gave it time to fortify itself and build up a strength so respectable that it later succeeded in subjugating the entire confederation almost as easily as we ourselves could previously have defeated it. The junta based its policy on poorly understood principles of humanity which do not authorize governments to use force in order to liberate peoples who are ignorant of the value of their rights. The codes consulted by our magistrates were not those which could teach them the practical science of government, but were those devised by certain benevolent visionaries who, creating fantastic republics in their imaginations, have sought to attain political perfection assuming the perfectibility of the human race. Thus we were given philosophers for leaders, philanthropy for legislation, dialectic for tactics, and sophists for soldiers. Through such a distortion of principles, the social order was thoroughly shaken, and from that time on, the state made giant strides towards its general dissolution, which, indeed, shortly came to pass. Out of this crisis came a degree of impunity for crimes committed against the state. These crimes were committed without shame or fear, particularly by our born and implacable enemies, the European Spaniards, who had remained in our country solely to cause trouble, to keep it in continual turmoil, and to foster as many conspiracies as our judges allowed them. These judges were too keen to pardon even when the plots were of such magnitude as to endanger public welfare. The doctrine which supported this procedure had its origin in the charitable maxims of a few writers who defend the thesis that no man is vested with the right to deprive another of his life, even though he be guilty of the crime of treason. Under the cloak of this pious doctrine, Every conspiracy was followed by a pardon, 
and every pardon by another conspiracy, which again brought pardon. All because liberal governments feel obliged to distinguish themselves through clemency. But this criminal clemency, more than anything else, contributed to the destruction of the structure whose construction we had still to complete. This weakness was also behind the firm opposition to raising seasoned, disciplined troops prepared to take their place on the field of battle and indoctrinated with the desire to defend liberty with success and honour. Instead, innumerable undisciplined militia units were formed. The exorbitant salaries paid to the officers of these units only exhausted the funds of the national treasury. Agriculture was destroyed because farmers were torn from their homes. This brought hatred upon the government, which had forced them to abandon their families and take up arms. Republics, said our statesmen, have no need for salaried soldiers to maintain their liberty. Every citizen will become a soldier when the enemy attacks us. Greece, Rome, Venice, Genoa, Switzerland, Holland, and recently North America defeated their adversaries without the aid of mercenary troops, who stand always ready to support despotism and subjugate their fellow citizens. With such political thinking and inaccurate reasoning, they deceived the simple-minded, but they did not convince the judicious, who clearly understood the immense difference between the people's times and customs of those republics and ours. It is true that they did not pay standing armies, but that was because these did not exist in antiquity. The safety and the honour of their states was entrusted to their civic virtues, their austere habits, and their military qualities, traits which we are very far from possessing. As regards the modern nations which have thrown off the yoke of tyranny, it is well known that they have maintained the number of hardened veterans necessary to ensure their security. North America, however, being at peace with the world and protected by the sea, has not seen fit in recent years to maintain the complement of veteran troops needed to defend her borders and cities. What followed in Venezuela was bitter evidence of the error of her calculations. The militia that went to meet the enemy, not knowing how to handle arms and unaccustomed to discipline and obedience, was routed at the very beginning of the last campaign, notwithstanding the heroic and extraordinary efforts of their leaders to lead them to victory. This defeat caused general discouragement among soldiers and officers, for it is a military truth that only battle-hardened armies are capable of surmounting the first reverses of a campaign. The novice soldier believes all is lost when he has once been routed. Experience has not proved to him that bravery, skill, and perseverance can mend misfortune. The subdivision of the province of Caracas, which was planned, discussed, and sanctioned by the Federal Congress, awakened and fomented bitter rivalry against the capital in the smaller cities and towns. Which, said congressmen, eager for control of their districts, was the tyrant among cities and the leech of the state. In this way, the flame of civil war was kindled in Valencia, and was never extinguished even when its rebellion was defeated. It remained hidden under the surface and spread to the adjacent towns of Curo and Maracaibo. These cities established communications with Valencia, thereby facilitating the entry of the Spaniards, which brought about the fall of Venezuela. The dissipation of the public taxes for frivolous and harmful purposes, and particularly on salaries for an infinite number of office holders, secretaries, judges, magistrates, and provincial and federal legislators dealt the Republic a mortal blow, since it was obliged to seek recourse in the dangerous expedient of issuing paper money with no other guarantee than the probable revenues and backing of the Confederation. This new money, in the eyes of most people, 
was a direct violation of property rights, because they felt that they were being deprived of objects of intrinsic value in exchange for others of uncertain and even problematic worth. The paper money roused discontent among the otherwise indifferent people of the interior. Hence, they called upon the commandant of the Spanish troops to come and free them from a currency which they regarded with more horror than slavery. But what weakened the Venezuelan government most was the federal form it adopted in keeping with the exaggerated precepts of the rights of man. By authorizing each man to rule himself, the federal system disrupts social contracts and reduces nations to anarchy. This was what happened to the Confederation. Each province governed itself independently, and following this example, each city demanded like powers based on the practice of the provinces and on the theory that all men and all peoples are entitled to establish whatever form of government they wish. The federal system, although the most perfect and the most capable of providing for human happiness in society, is nevertheless the most contrary to the interests of our infant states. Generally speaking, our fellow citizens are not yet able to exercise their rights themselves in the fullest measure, because they lack the political virtues that characterize true republicans. Virtues that are not acquired under absolute governments, where the rights and duties of the citizen are not recognized. Moreover, what country in the world, however well trained and republican it may be, can, amidst internal factions and foreign war, be governed by so complicated and weak a system as the federal? No. This system cannot possibly be maintained during the turbulence of battles and political factions. It is essential that a government mould itself, so to speak, to the nature of the circumstances, the times, and the men that comprise it. If these are prosperity and peace, the government should be mild and protecting. But if they are turbulence and disaster, it should be stern and arm itself with a firmness that matches the dangers, without regard for laws or constitutions, until happiness and peace have been re-established. Caracas was made to suffer severely by the shortcomings of the Confederation, which, far from aiding it, exhausted its treasury and war supplies. When danger threatened, the Confederation abandoned the city to its fate without assisting it with even a small contingent. The Confederation, moreover, created new difficulties, for the rivalry which developed between the Federal and the Provincial authorities enabled the enemies to penetrate deep into the heart of the state and to occupy a large part of the province before the question as to whether Federal or Provincial troops should go out to repel them was settled. This fatal debate resulted in a terrible and costly delay to our armies, for they were routed at San Carlos while awaiting the reinforcements needed for victory. I believe that until we centralize our American governments, our enemy will gain irreversible advantages. We will inevitably fall into the horrors of civil warfare and be miserably defeated by the handful of bandits who infest our lands. The popular elections held by the simple people of the country and by the scheming inhabitants of the city added a further obstacle to our practice of federation, because the former are so ignorant that they cast their votes mechanically, and the latter so ambitious that they convert everything into factions. As a result, Venezuela never witnessed a free and proper election, and the government was placed in the hands of men who were either inept, immoral, or opposed to the cause of independence. Party spirit determined everything, and consequently caused us more disorganization than the circumstances themselves. Our division, not Spanish arms, returned us to slavery. The March the 26th earthquake, it is true, was physically and morally destructive, and can properly be termed the immediate cause of Venezuela's ruin. 
but the earthquake would not have produced such fatal results if, at the time, Caracas had been governed by a single authority. Acting promptly and vigorously, it could have repaired the damage without the hindrances and rivalries which delayed the recovery in the provinces and left problems to fester until they became incurable. If Caracas had established the simple government that its political and military situation required, instead of a slow-moving and insubstantial confederation, Venezuela would still exist and enjoy its freedom today. Following the earthquake, the influence of the Catholic Church played a very considerable part in fomenting the insurgency of villages and smaller towns, and in bringing enemies into the country. They abused the sanctity of their ministry most sacrilegiously on behalf of the men who fomented civil war. Still, we must honestly admit that these traitorous priests were encouraged to commit the execrable crimes of which they are justly accused, because they knew that they enjoyed absolute immunity for their crimes, scandalously supported by Congress. This travesty of justice reached such a point that, following the insurrection of the city of Valencia, whose pacification cost nearly 1,000 lives, not a single rebel was brought to justice. They all kept their lives, and many retained their property. From the above, it follows that among the causes that brought about Venezuela's downfall, the nature of its constitution ranks first which, I repeat, was as contrary to Venezuela's interests as it was favorable to those of her adversaries. Second, the spirit of misanthropy which possessed our governing officials. Third, the opposition to the establishment of a military force which could save the Republic and repulse the Spanish attacks. Fourth, the earthquake and its exploitation by fanaticism for its own advantage. And last, the internal factions, which in reality were the fatal poison that laid the country in its tomb. The South American peoples who aspire to freedom and independence will be able to learn some lessons from these tales of error and misfortune. New Granada has seen Venezuela collapse, and should therefore avoid the pitfalls that destroyed her. To this end, I submit... It is essential to reconquer Caracas in order to preserve New Granada's security. At first sight, this project will appear far-fetched, costly, perhaps impracticable. But, examined closely with foresight and careful reflection, it is as impossible to deny its necessity as to fail to put it into execution once it is proved advisable. The first factor which offers itself in support of this operation is the fundamental cause of the destruction of Caracas, which was simply the contempt with which the city regarded the existence of an enemy who appeared of little account, but who, taken in his true light, was not so at all. Coro certainly could not have competed with Caracas if physical preponderance had been the deciding factor. But in history, the strongest peoples do not always win out. Often, it is moral power that determines the political balance. And for this reason, the government of Venezuela should surely have eradicated an apparently weak enemy, which nevertheless enjoyed the support of the province of Maracaibo, by all those provinces which obeyed the regency, by gold, as well as the cooperation of our eternal enemies, the Europeans who reside among us. Furthermore, Coro was supported by the clerical party, ever devoted to its master and companion, despotism. Coro had, above all, the unwavering support of every ignorant and superstitious person within the limits of our states. In the event, all it took was for one treacherous officer to summon the enemy in, and the entire political system was unbalanced, 
and all the unparalleled patriotic efforts of the defenders of Caracas were insufficient to prevent the fall of an edifice already tottering from the blow that it had received from one single man. Applying the example of Venezuela to New Granada and putting it in the form of a ratio, we find that Coro is to Caracas as Caracas is to all America. This formula demonstrates the degree of danger which threatens this country. Given Spain's possession of the territory of Venezuela, she can easily draw upon it for men, provisions and munitions of war, and her armies under the direction of leaders who have had experience against those great masters of warfare, the French, can move inland from the provinces of Barinas and Maracaibo to South America's deepest interior. Spain today has a great number of daring and ambitious general officers, long accustomed to danger and to privations, who long to come here and seek an empire to replace that which they have just lost. It is probable that as Spanish power collapses in the Iberian Peninsula, there will be a tremendous emigration of men of all classes, particularly of cardinals, archbishops, bishops, canons and revolutionary clerics, all capable not only of subverting our incipient, faltering states, but of submerging the entire new world in frightful anarchy. The religious influence, the rule of civil and military domination, and all the prestige they can bring to bear upon the human spirit will be additional instruments which they will use in subjugating these countries. Nothing will stand in the way of Spanish emigration. England will probably assist in the escape of a group whose departure would weaken Napoleon Bonaparte's forces in Spain, and would increase and add new life to England's own power in America. Neither France nor North America will be able to prevent this movement, and neither will we. All our efforts would be futile, as none of us has a navy worthy of the name. These fugitives will surely receive a warm welcome in the Venezuelan ports, as they will be coming to reinforce the oppressors of that country, and to undertake the conquest of the independent states. They will raise fifteen or twenty thousand men, whom their leaders, officers, sergeants, corporals, and veteran soldiers will rapidly drill and discipline. This army will be followed by another yet more terrible, of ministers, ambassadors, counsellors, magistrates, or the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the grandees of Spain, whose trade is deceit and intrigue, and all bearing imposing titles designed to dazzle the multitude. And, descending like a torrent, they will overrun the land, tearing Colombia's tree of liberty down to its very roots. The troops will fight on the field, but this army will battle us from their desks, using seduction and fanaticism for arms. In order to guard against these calamities, we will have no other recourse but to pacify our rebellious provinces as fast as we can before turning our arms upon our enemies. In this way, we will develop a body of soldiers and officers worthy to be called the nation's army. Everything conspires to make us adopt this measure. In addition to the urgent necessity of closing the gates against the enemy, there are other reasons which force us to take the offensive, reasons so overwhelming that it would be a military error and a political blunder not to do so. We have been invaded, and consequently we are obliged to hurl the enemy back across the border. Moreover, it is a principle of the art of war that every defensive action is harmful and ruinous for those who wage it, as it weakens them without hope of recovery. Hostilities in enemy territory, however, are always advantageous by reason of the good that results from the enemy's misfortunes. Therefore, on no account should we allow ourselves to go on the defensive. We must also consider the present condition of the enemy, who is in a very critical position. 
the majority of his Creole soldiers have deserted at a time when he is obliged to garrison the patriot cities of Caracas, Puerto Cabello, La Guaira, Barcelona, Cumana, and Margarita, where he keeps his stores. He does not dare to leave these towns unguarded, for fear of a general insurrection the moment he departs. Thus, it would not be impossible for our troops to reach the gates of Caracas without engaging in a single open battle. As soon as we enter Venezuela, we can be certain that we will be joined by thousands of brave patriots who anxiously await our arrival in order to throw off the yoke of their tyrants and unite their efforts with ours in the defense of liberty. The nature of the present campaign affords us the advantage of approaching Maracaibo by way of Santa Marta and Barinas by way of Cucuta. Let us take advantage, therefore, of such a propitious moment. Reinforcements may arrive at any time from Spain, which would completely alter the state of affairs and remove what might be a unique opportunity to assure the destiny of these states. New Granada's honor absolutely demands that we teach these audacious invaders a lesson by pursuing them to their last strongholds. New Granada's glory depends upon its taking on the task of marching to Venezuela and liberating the cradle of Colombian independence, the martyrs and worthy people of Caracas. They address their cries only to their beloved New Granadan compatriots, and they await the arrival of these redeemers with despairing impatience. Let us march on to break the chains of the victims who groan in the dungeons, ever hopeful of rescue. Do not betray the trust they place in you. Do not be deaf to the cries of your brothers. Fly to avenge the dead, to give life to the dying, to bring freedom to the oppressed and liberty to all. Simon Bolivar